Welcome guests, visitors, members, and friends. We appreciate having you here to join us for worship today, especially if you're here in the church with all the nice snow and crustiness outside. Um, if there are, could we hear a couple beeps from the horns if anybody's in the parking lot? Okie dokie. And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook um, and you can listen to our services on the phone by calling 734-206-2548. Uh, for announcements, I know that, uh, let's see, Dave Munson has a worship, a uh, Bible study coming up. It's not this week. Uh, I think it might be next week, but I know it's coming up. And we'll be doing the food gatherers distribution at Bishop on Tuesday. And are there any other announcements that we might have think of or anything? Okay. Why don't we start our service by the call to worship, and I will read, and then you may follow. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the true light that enlightens everyone. has come into the world. Glory to God who has blessed us in Christ. Glory to God forever. And if you will read with me, God of glory, your word made a home with us so that we might be at home in you. Gather your children from the farthest places in the world and lead us to that home where the human race can become a human family through Jesus Christ and in the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first hymn is Emmanuel, Emmanuel. If you're using the church hymnal, it's 204. Let us join together in repeating our affirmation of faith for Epiphany in the season after Epiphany. <clears throat> we believe in God, the creator of all things, the giver of life and breath. We believe in Jesus Christ, born Emmanuel, God with us, baptized and revealed, the most beloved Son of God. He sought to heal humanity by taking our brokenness upon himself, suffering for us, dying for us, and being raised from the dead for our sake and for the sake of all the world. We believe that he will come again. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
continually pouring out, refreshing our lives, leading us into a new day, ever birthing the church, the body of Christ in the world. This spirit is our sole companion and counselor of truth, reminding us of the gift of faith, the ever presence of God, and the promise of eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. And shall we join together in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are going to be enjoying some special music now from Tammy and Teresa. <coughs> Thank you, Barb. Mm -hmm. And a man named Pietro Yon, spelled Y-O-N, Pietro Yon, was an Italian musician and organist who immigrated to the United States in the early 1900s. He served as the organist at several large Catholic cathedrals in New York City. Just over 100 years ago, in 1917, Pietro Yon wrote a new Christmas song, Jesu Bambino, or The Infant Jesus. He composed the words and the music for the verses, and then for the chorus, he used the pre-existing chorus from O Come All You Faithful, which had been written in the mid-1700s. Today, Jesu Bambino is sometimes presented in Italian, sometimes in English, but in any case, you'll probably recognize this beautiful tune. <coughs> Oh, come, let us adore. 
was that not beautiful? We are blessed to have Teresa with that wonderful voice of hers. If you haven't noticed already, um, Michael's not here today. I believe they'll be traveling back from Chicagoland. And so we hope that he has a safe journey and that he's enjoyed some, some wellness, some mindfulness and a rest over this busy holiday season. And I forgot to wish everybody a happy new year. Woo! 2022, let's get rid of 2021. We are ready for the new year. Um, at this point, we're going to have the invitation to the offering. Christ has lavished upon us the riches of his grace. Therefore, let us offer our lives and the fruits of our labor to God. Lord Jesus Christ, your goodness to us is beyond the reaches of our imagination, a fullness of love that embraces all of life. From you, we have received grace upon grace. Accept our offering for the sake of the world. All that we have is yours, and all we return to you is but a reflection of your love for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And if you, this is going to be kind of a different day, an exciting day. We're going to have what I guess we could consider a song fest. We're going to be singing our Christmas carols one last time. And I need my glasses off. Is that Barb Zufo? Hi, Barb. It's good to see you. <laughs> Welcome back. Good morning, church. Good morning. 
If you recall four or five years ago when I was up here for whatever reason, <clears throat> I said that history was one of my least favorite subjects in school. And since that time, an eon ago, it has become much more interesting to me, probably because now I am a part of it, history. And isn't it always entertaining to say to your kids, oh, that was way before your time. At any rate, we are going to take a little look at some history behind several of our favorite Christmas songs. The first three that I will be reporting on took inspiration from the Psalms, and they are short, so sit back and enjoy. Uh, there's a little bump in the program. Um, we will start with, there's a song in the air before I heard the bells on Christmas Day, which is second. And I think Fonda is running it off right now. And she will be in with that music. <clears throat> so let's start with, there's a song in the air. Can you hear me? <clears throat> takes inspiration from Psalms 149. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of saints. There's a song in the air. For a long time, Josiah Gilbert Holland was known to his friends as a failure at just about everything he tried. Dropping out of high school, he tried his hand at photography, then calligraphy. When those professions didn't pan out, Josiah, then 21, enrolled in Berkshire Medical College. And after graduation, he practiced medicine in Springfield, Massachusetts. He did this for a while before quitting to start a newspaper. The paper folded after six months. At length, he joined the editorial staff of another newspaper, the Springfield Republican, and there he finally found his niche in writing. In 1865, the world was stunned by the tragic assassination of Abraham Lincoln. The next year, it was Josiah Holland who published the first major biography of Lincoln. In it, he presented Lincoln as a true-hearted Christian and provided a number of stories to reinforce the point. When Lincoln's free-thinking law partner, William Herndon, read the book, he refuted it. Lincoln was an infidel, declared Herndon, and he died as an unbeliever. To this day, historians argue about Lincoln's religious faith or lack of it, but the notoriety put Josiah Holland on the literary map of his day. In 1870, he became a founder and the senior editor of Scribner's Magazine. He continued publishing books and was quite prolific. In 1872, he published The Marble Prophecy and Other Poems. In it were four stanzas of There's a Song in the Air. It was an unusual poem in that the first four lines of each stanza contained six syllables each, but the fifth and sixth lines were twice as long. If you've ever tried to write poetry, you know what a nightmare can be if you have no talent in that area at all. Two years later, it was set to music in a collection of Sunday school songs, but didn't achieve widespread popularity. Several years after Josiah's death in 1881, a Latin professor named Carl Pomeroy Harrington read, There's a Song in the Air. Harrington was an amateur musician who had begun writing melodies as a youngster on the small organ in his childhood home. Harrington later inherited that old Estee organ and moved it to his vacation cottage in North Woodstock, New Hampshire. While spending the summer there in 1904, he sat down at the old instrument, pumping the bellows with the foot pedals, and hammered out the lovely melodic tune to which there's a song in the air is now widely sung. Please join us for this song from the hymnal, number 249, There's a Song in the Air.
I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Do you all have a copy from Fonda? Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep, from Psalm 121. The famous Longfellow brothers were born and raised in Portland, Maine in the 1800s. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was born in 1807, and his younger brother Samuel arrived in 1819. Henry became a Harvard professor of literature and one of America's greatest writers, and Samuel became a Unitarian minister and hymnist. While Henry was publishing his books, however, dark clouds were gathering over his life and over all of America. In 1861, his wife tragically died when her dress caught fire in their home in Cambridge, Mass. That same year, the Civil War broke out, tearing the nation apart. Two years later, during the fiercest days of conflict, Henry's son, Charlie, 17, ran away from home and hopped aboard a train to join President Lincoln's army. Charlie proved a brave and popular soldier. He saw action at the Battle of Chancellorville in 1863, but in early June, he contracted typhoid fever and malaria and was sent home to recover. He missed the Battle of Gettysburg, but by August, Charlie was well enough to return to the field. On November 27th, during the Battle of New Hope Church in Virginia, he was shot through the left shoulder the bullet nicked his spine and came close to paralyzing him. He was carried into the church and later taken to Washington to recuperate. Receiving the news on December 1st, 1863, Henry left immediately for Washington. He found his son well enough to travel and they headed back to Cambridge, arriving home on December 8th. For weeks, Henry sat by his son's bedside, slowly nursing his boy back to health. And on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1863, Henry gave vent to his feelings in this plaintive carol that can only be understood against the backdrop of war. Two stanzas, now omitted from most hymnals, speak of the cannons thundering in the south and of hate, hated tearing apart the hearthstones of a continent. The poet feels like dropping his head in despair, but then he hears the Christmas bells. Their triumphant pealing reminds him that God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The Sunday school children of the Unitarian Church of the Disciples in Boston first sang this song during that year's Christmas celebration. How wonderful that such a song should emerge from the bloody clouds of the war between the states. Please stand with us if you are able. I heard the bells on Christmas Day.
The third one I'm going to tell you about is Angels from the Realm of Glory. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. From Psalm 148. Like all Moravians, John Montgomery had a burden for world evangelism. He was the only Moravian pastor in Scotland, but he and his wife felt God's call to be missionaries to the island of Barbados, tearfully placing his six-year-old son James in a Moravian settlement in Braceville, Ireland, they sailed away. James never saw them again, for they perished in Barbados. Left with nothing, James was enrolled in a school in England. When he didn't do well, he was apprenticed by school authorities to a baker. Baking wasn't for James. He ran away and spent his teenage years drifting from pillar to post, writing poetry and trying his hand at one thing and then another. He eventually settled down in Sheffield, England. In his early 20s, James began working for the local newspaper, the Sheffield Register, and there he found his niche. He loved writing. It was a politically active new newspaper, and, in its, and when its owner had to suddenly flee the country to avoid persecution and imprisonment, James purchased the paper and renamed it the Sheffield Iris. His editorials, too, proved unpopular with local officials. On two separate occasions, he also was thrown into jail. But he emerged from prison a celebrity, and he used his newly acquired fame to pro promote his favorite issues. Chief among them was the gospel. Despite the loss of his parents, James Montgomery remained devoted to Christ and to the scriptures, and he championed the cause of foreign missions and the British Bible Society. As years passed, he became the most respected leader in Sheffield, and his writings were eagerly read by its citizens. Early on Christmas Eve, 1816, James, then 45, opened his Bible to Luke chapter 2 and was deeply impressed by verse 13. Pondering the story of the heralding angels, he took his pen and started writing. By the end of the day, his new Christmas poem was being read in the pages of his newspaper. It was later set to music and was first sung on Christmas Day, 1821, in a Moravian church in England, angels from the realms of glory. His parents would have been proud. Yeah. 
interesting to hear the backstory on these uh, song, songs, isn't it? Our next hymn will be Joy to the World from 1719. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises from Psalm 98, verse 4. Until Isaac Watts came along, most of the singing in British churches was from the Psalms of David. The church, especially the Church of Scotland, had labored over the Psalms with great effort and scholarship, translating them into poems with rhyme and rhythm suitable for singing. As a young man in Southampton, Isaac had become dissatisfied with the quality of singing and he keenly felt the limitations of being able to only sing these psalms. So he invented the English hymn. He did not, however, neglect the psalms. In 1719, he published a unique hymnal, one in which he had translated, interpreted, and paraphrased the Old Testament psalms through the eyes of New Testament faith. He called it simply, the Psalms of David imitated in the language of the New Testament. Taking various Psalms, he studied them from the perspective of Jesus and the New Testament, and then formed them into verses for singing. I have rather expressed myself as I may suppose David would have done if he lived in the days of Christianity, Watts explained. And by this means, perhaps, I have sometimes hit upon the true intent of the Spirit of God in those verses farther and clearer than David himself could ever discover. Watts' arch enemy, Thomas Bradbury, was greatly critical of Watts' songs, which he called whims instead of hymns. He accused Watts of thinking he was King David. Watts replied in a letter, you tell me that I rival it with David whether he or I be the sweet psalmist of Israel. I abhor the thought while yet at the same time, I am fully persuaded that the Jewish psalm book was never designed to be the only psalter for the Christian church. Joy to the world is Isaac Watts' interpretation of Psalm 98, which says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, verse four. As he read Psalm 98, Isaac pondered the real reason for shouting joyfully to the Lord. The Messiah has come to redeem us. The result, despite the now forgotten criticisms of men like Bradbury, has been a timeless carol that has brightened our Christmases for nearly 300 years. Please stand with us if you are able.
away in a manger. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke chapter 7, verse 7. This is commonly known as Luther's cradle hymn. But did the great German reformer, Martin Luther, really write the words? Did he sing them by the cradle of his little son, Hans? This is a great mystery in hymnology. In 1887, Away in the Manger appeared in a little book of songs entitled Dainty Songs for Little Lads and Lassies, published in Cincinnati, by the John Church Company. The song book was compiled by James R. Murray. A notation beneath a way in a manger said, Luther's Cradle Hymn, composed by Martin Luther for his children and still sung by German mothers to their little ones. Only stanzas one and two were given. A way in a manger quickly became America's favorite children's carol the words being sung to 41 different tunes. Everyone assumed the poem had been written by the great reformer Martin Luther. Then in 1945, Richard Hill published a fascinating article entitled, Not So Far Away in a Manger, in which he announced he had discovered the first two stanzas of Away in a Manger in an 1885 songbook entitled Little Children's Book, published by G German Lutherans in Pennsylvania. No authorship was given. Nor could Hill find any appearance of this carol in German church history or in Luther's works. After extensive research, Hill concluded it seems essential to lay aside once, for, once and for all the legend that Luther wrote a carol for his children, which no one else knew anything about until it suddenly turned up in an English dress 400 years later in Philadelphia. Luther can well afford to spare the honor. But he adds, although Luther himself had nothing to do with the carol, the colonies of German Lutherans in Pennsylvania almost certainly did. So the mystery endures. Who wrote Away in a Manger? There were apparently two unknown writers, a German Lutheran in Pennsylvania who wrote the first two stanzas with another unknown author adding a third verse that appeared in an 1892 songbook published by Charles H. Gabriel, well, who cares? Certainly not the generations of children around the world who have come to love and know the little Jesus through this sweet carol and who have gone to sleep praying, I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Oh, so, so. 
the first Noel. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. No other carol cast such a spell. The sweet plaintive strains of the first Noel quietly sung on a snow-clad Christmas Eve bring tears to the eyes and gentle peace to the heart. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel. If only we knew who wrote it. It first appeared anonymously in some ancient Christmas carols published by Davis Gilbert in 1823, and the traditional music evidently came from an unknown source in the west of England. The poetry itself is plain. If we were to recite this rather lengthy piece, we'd get only a garbled sense of the Christmas story. There's no indication in scripture, for example, that the shepherds saw the Magi star. And the final verse of the original carol seems anticlimactic. But when combined with its wistful music, the words glow in our hearts are strangely warmed. The word Noel seems to be a French word with Latin roots, natalis, meaning birthday. Oh, 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 oh,
Have I made you dizzy yet? Going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Hark the herald angels sing. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Upon his conversion, Charles Wesley immediately began writing hymns, each one packed with doctrine, all of them exhibiting strength and sensitivity, both beauty and theological brawn. He wrote constantly, and even on horseback, his mind was flooded with new songs. He often stopped at houses along the road and ran in asking for pen and ink. He wrote more than 6,000 hymns during his life, and he didn't like pink people tinkering with the words. In one of his hymnals, he wrote, I beg leave to mention a thought which has been long upon my mind, in which I should long ago have inserted in the public papers had I not been unwilling to stir up a nest of hornets. Many gentlemen have done my brother and me though without naming us, the honor to reprint many of our hymns. Now they are perfectly welcome to do so, provided they print them just as they are. But I desire they would not attempt to mend them, for they are really not able. None of them is able to mend either the sense or the verse. Therefore, I beg of them these two favors either to let them stand just as they are, to take things for better or worse, or to add the true reading in the margin or at the bottom of the page, that we may no longer be accountable either for the nonsense or for the doggerel of other men. But one man did the church a great favor by polishing up one of Charles's best loved hymns. When Charles was 32, he wrote a Christmas hymn that began, Oh, Lord. Hark, how all the welkin rings. Glory to the King of Kings. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. Universal nature say, Christ the Lord is born today. The word welkin was an old English term for the vault of heaven. It was Charles's friend, evangelist George Whitefield, who, when he published this carol in his collection of hymns in 1753, changed the words to the now beloved, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Please stand as you are able. Joyful! 
Beloved children of God, go forth in the grace of Christ. We rejoice in his grace. Go forth in the light of Christ. We walk in his light. Go forth in the love of Christ. We serve in his love. May God, the fount of all wisdom, bless you and guide you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.